in session today we have a topic on organizing palliative care services so we can start with sir's presentation we can have it for around 1 hour followed by a discussion so thank you all for joining in over to sunil sir good afternoon all um, so till now we had a session so on symptom control mostly medical topics now uh, we are uh, going to have a topic which will help us to uh, understand what all things need to be done to set up a palliative care unit what are the important things that we should know uh, so this session is going to be uh, deal by uh, mr vinod hariharan so mr vinod is basically an engineering graduate and uh, he is also md of uh, two institutions but he is a trustee of palliative care india and uh, he is actively involved in all the activities of palliative care india uh, mainly in the organizational and administration aspect so he will be able to tell you how to set up a palliative care unit so uh, welcome vinod and it's over to you am i audible yes yes you are audible so um Good afternoon, everyone. Um, how big is the group? May I ask, Raju? Uh, sir, it's complete. All are doctors, sir, from different parts of country. Oh, wonderful! Thank you. Okay, so I'll uh, share my screen um, from my end. Just hold on. Yes, sir. Is it clear? Is it visible? Yes, yes it's visible. Okay. Yeah. So, um, as uh, Dr. Sunil uh, mentioned, um, you know, so far I believe we've been um, dealing with a lot of medical topics um, about uh, uh, you know, how to uh, provide palliative care to a patient in need. <clears throat> what are the things to be considered what are the, the communication skills probably that you need to uh, acquire to deal with the uh, situations and all those things now um, often what we find is you know as medical professionals when i say medical professionals i uh, am including doctors nurses social workers uh, you know para medical service or whatever now mostly um, we are trained to provide the care to the patient but often what we find is once you complete this course uh, whether it is online or offline you understand a lot of pal about palliative care you understand about how to provide the care but the challenge is still remain why primarily because the institutions where you are coming from may not have a palliative care team you may or may not have a current services running you may not have a team which is trained to offer this kind of care and of course the big challenge you know how to find the patients you know how do we get them to us or us to them so without which you know until and unless you are in front of a patient and you have the, the setting to provide the care uh, whatever we whatever training we get through this course uh, it beca it becomes uh, immaterial so that is why you know this kind of a topic has been included in the course so we have an hour i believe right raju up to 4 Ten is it? Yes, sir. Yeah. So this is a challenge in itself because um, you know this is something which uh, should normally take around five to six hours at least. But let's see um, how we can cover this. And uh, I'd like to 
um, have it as more of a discussion. So feel free to interrupt in between wherever you feel uh, you have questions or queries. Um, okay, so. So mainly we're going to cover um, these topics. One is volunteering, collaborating, advocacy and fundraising, and morphine, you know how, I mean, this is specifically uh, in the context, uh, in the Indian context, you know, the morphine procurement and dispensing. I hope all of you are from within India. Am I right in assuming so? Um, uh, sir, uh, most of them are from India, but we have Dr. Grace from Nigeria and Dr. Shahanas from Bangladesh. Oh, wonderful. So, so this may, uh, may not be relevant in that particular setting, but I'll cover it. Um, let's move forward. So this is a definition which we are all familiar with, uh, the definition of palliative care. So essentially we are talking about assessment and treatment of pain, other symptoms, physical, psychological, social and spiritual. And it's about the patient and the families. Okay, fine. Now, what is required to provide that kind of a care? Obviously, we are not talking about one individual or maybe a doctor and a nurse trying to provide this or solving the problems for the patient. It is simply not possible. So, uh, who are required to provide this kind of a care? So we're talking about the care team and that care team should be able to, to understand the needs of the patient and the family and then to maybe even innovate to provide the right kind of care what is required. So for this you, you also need to understand this concept of total pain. Um, we all know by now that uh, it is not just about the physical pain that we are talking about. It is about the psychological, social, spiritual pain, which, which is the, the combined pain is probably much, much more than the physical pain, uh, probably what the, the patient is going through. So, so we need to address this total pain. It is not just about the physical pain, what we are talking about. Now, who has to do this? You know, whose business is it? Uh, can I have can I have some answers? You know, uh, I believe all of you, Raju, they can also step in, right? Yes, sir. Anyone yes. wishes to answer? So, whose business is it? That is the question. You know, who is supposed to take care of this? Anyone? Sorry. Is there anybody who want to ha uh, have some come up with some answers for whose business is it? Palliative care, whose business is? Dr. Grace? No. Hello? Hello, yes, yes Dr. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can, can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can it's hear you. It's not very clear. Sorry, it's not very clear. Yeah. Am I not audible? Mm -hmm. Okay, so my question was, uh, you know, we understand uh, the palliative, you know, what, what palliative care means to a patient. The question is, uh, whose business is it? Who is supposed to take care of this? Who is supposed to take care? I mean, provide this care. So or that's the uh, chat, chat answer. And Dr. Gida says it's community. It is uh, okay. every stakeholder. Okay. So are we in agreement here that palliative care is everyone's business? Because until and unless we are clear about this, Sorry, yeah. So until we are here clear about this, you know, there is no role for a person like me to be talking to you about palliative care. 
because I don't have a medical background. So people like me with absolutely zero medical background, if they need to be involved as a stakeholder, I believe it should be the, the, the medical community also has to accept that as a fact and let people like me inside. Okay, so, so if I were to say I mean, or ask you who all would be the team members to, to provide this kind of care, you know, anyone can answer. Just come up with uh, whatever comes to your mind. There is no, um, you know, right and wrong answer here. Whoever, I mean, you feel should be involved in the caregiving team. It is the doctor. Okay. The family members, the community. Yes. And other stakeholders. Okay. The doctors, nurses, nurses. Yes. Family members. Okay. Or caregivers. Family yes. members, caregivers. Yes, so yeah. you're right, you're right. I mean, normally um, we tend to think about the doctors, nurses, pharmacists, social workers, therapists, you know, bereavement counselors, but often we tend to ignore these two categories, that is the volunteers and the caregivers, without whom, you know, none of this would be possible, obviously. Now, if I can simplify this and put it into one sentence, anyone who can contribute to this care is part of the team. Now, it sounds idealistic or utopian. And uh, yes, I understand. I agree that there are a lot of challenges here. It's easy to say that, yes, I would like to work with a volunteer. But then before we work with a volunteer, we should also be clear, what is it that we are expecting out of a volunteer? What is it that uh, they feel uh, they, they will be able to contribute? How far we are willing to accept them and, and consider them as part of a, 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 a healthcare delivery system? So these kind of things are also equally challenging. And so is the caregiver. Often we tend to ignore the caregiver within the family and we should not forget that you know, they are the people who are closest to the patient and who can provide him with the care that we want him to get. Often the medical team is far away. The family members, the caregivers who are staying with the patient are the people who can offer the first line of help. So, here is a typical scenario, you know, you have the medical facilities at the macro level. We're talking about hospitals, the government, private sector, whatnot, um, and other uh, institutions which are providing the care. And then, of course, we have this at the micro level, which is always, remember, it is always the family. And that is that is the care, I mean, that is the, the, the first level of medical care or health care that everyone has got access to. Just imagine you have a, a fever, high fever. Who is the person who is going to provide you care? Obviously, it is not a doctor or a nurse. It could be your mother or a sister or a brother or your son who is going to provide you with maybe uh, some relief. Uh, you know, and then we think about the doctors and the hospitals and all those things. Now, what we are going to talk about is something in the middle. It's called the meso level. And this is where things get very interesting. Now, can you tell me who is, I mean, who are the service providers at the meso level? That is the level between the macro and the micro. So, 
So this is the society what you are talking about, you and me included. You know, no one is outside this. And the thing is, often the, the potential of this community, we call it the social capital, you know, because it's just like any other capital that we can think of. Like uh, typically, if you are if you, if you want to set up something new, the first thing that comes to mind is you know I need money, I need money to set up a hospital, I need money to set up a palliative care center, I need money to 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 uh, you know engage a, a nurse or have a, a, a what do you call a home care vehicle. Now these are things which are important. I agree. But then what we should also not forget is that there is a huge potential lying here which is not actually which is not actually being uh, utilized fully. So it is about finding out how to utilize this capital. And believe me when I say this, a lot of the challenges that you're going to face going forward in providing palliative care can be solved through this. I mean, when I say this, it is the society which can step in and, and support you in providing uh, the, the, the care. Now, I should also mention one thing here. The reason why, you know, Palim India or even Kerala uh, in general came into focus in the, in the palliative care scene it's because of the community's involvement. It is because of the society's invo involvement in palliative care. Now, it is not that palliative care started off in Kerala or Trivandrum. It started off in the UK as everyone knows. But then what, what, um, um, what changed or what a major difference um, happened here in Kerala was that in 93, when it started off in Calicut, in Calicut Medical College, which is um, in the state of Kerala, apart from the doctors and nurses, the community also got involved. And that became a new model for healthcare delivery, not just in India, the world over. So when the society got involved, the community got involved, the, the limitations that the government facilities had, the limitations that the hospitals had in a country like India, which is, which is considered a developing country, the financial limitations and other limitations what we, we, uh, uh, we normally face, all those limitations gradually vanished. Now, this is where we as a developing country should focus and when I say this is something which was done in 92, 93, even today, apart from Kerala, I don't think many states, we are able to still replicate this model of the community-led palliative care. So that is a big challenge. I'm sure all of us here would continue to, to, to try and uh, solve this, this problem. So, we're talking about society, the community being involved. And that is where a volunteer comes into the picture. Now, if you look at the definition of a volunteer, it says, you know, you can Google it, you'll find that it's a person who takes on any activity without being ordered or told to do so. Fantastic. And he need not be paid. You know, that is a, another good thing about volunteers. You know, you don't have to pay them. So they come for free. Okay, that solves all the problems, right? But is that as simple as that? No. So, Vinod, uh, sir? So you wait for a couple of minutes.
are there anything else to be discussed Uh, hello all meanwhile vinod sir will be logging in so meanwhile i need to i like to ask you like uh, do you all need a class on opioid availability if you wish to yes how to in. access uh, what are the formalities all those things will be included in this session yeah so is it a problem if we plan it on a saturday for such a session will that be a problem so you can give your reply through your uh, through the mail or chat, chat. No, now itself so that we can plan one accordingly same timing uh, same timing same timing same timing 3 to 4:30 on any saturday same timing, same timing. yeah okay Uh, I suppose Vinod sir is back, so we can. I'm not have... getting my video. Play. Am I audible? Ah, uh, yeah. Yes, sir. Oh, so sorry. Um, there was a network connection at my end. Um, so should I share the screen? No, I think I'll share it here. Okay, sir. Okay, um, can you see the screen? Yes, sir. Can you see? The okay. So, we're trying to understand about volunteering and what, um, what makes a volunteer tick, in a sense. So, this is the story of uh, Kay and I. Now, uh, 63 now is uh, 63. Vinod, uh, your voice is breaking. Oh. Okay. Um. Still a problem. I'm using a network. Uh, can you come over the phone? We can call you from here so that uh, you can speak on the phone. Yes. Yes. Yes, sir, sir uh, you can. Sh uh, we. Uh, I mean, I will share the presentation. You can have it in your laptop, sir. All right. Okay. While calling through phone, you will not be able to see the screen. Um. No, that shouldn't be a problem because I am using uh, another. Sir, it is clear now, sir. You can continue. <laughs> sir, uh, your voice is clear now. You can continue. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. We can yes. hear you. Yeah. Okay. So, Ken Naya's wife was diagnosed with cancer and it was a very advanced stage and she died in November 2004. Now, if just imagine what if you were in this situation, you know, you had to go through a typical, uh, uh, what do you call it? 
hopping from one hospital to another, uh, meeting different doctors, you know, all of that. I, it, I believe uh, he, he, he took her to almost all the major hospitals in the city. Um, at least two or three years she has been going through, I mean, she was having these uh, symptoms, uh, problems, and then why, by the time it was diagnosed, it was too late. And it's a typical scenario, like, you know, you, you go to a doctor and then, uh, you, you know, an oncologist identifies, okay, this is cancer. And then, um, and they also tell you one more thing. Why did you earlier? It's so often you hear such a statement from a doctor, you know, you should have, you should have brought her here earlier or, you know, where were you all this time? Kind of thing. Now, imagine that you are in that situation. You lose your wife, you have done everything that you are supposed to do or what you thought was the right thing. And then you end up with this situation. A typical reaction would be, obviously there will be anger against the system. You'll, you'll, you'll think of you know, ways and means to you know, fight against the system. Sometimes you may go for a litigation. Uh, you may go meet the doctor or go to the hospital, make a big scene there. So all these things are possible. But K. N. Nair decided to do something else. Now, in his own words, what he said was, I lost my wife because the healthcare system did not respond properly. I and my wife did not get the care what we deserved. It is my duty to ensure that another person doesn't go through this same situation or end up in such a situation. So what he did was he found, tried to find entities, organizations who are in the patients in need, especially cancer patients. And by the time you know he had gone through all the medical uh, publications and all those things, he was well versed with um, you know the medical terminology and especially anything to do with cancer. And he also identified by the time, you know, he had identified that this was probably a case of medical negligence because she was never asked to undergo a pap test which should have been by one of the doctors, which never happened. So by the time he is, um, am I still audible, Raju? Is it clear? Your voice is still breaking in between. It is still breaking. Uh, I connect to the other network once again. Sure, sir. You can take your time and connect to the other network. Just hold on. Basically, the opioid availability session uh, class uh, deals with uh, um, what was the um, how uh, difficult uh, was uh, to access opioids previously, and what were the what what are the rules that uh, has come uh, to regulate the opioids in India? What are the amendment acts, and how can we access it now? Uh, and um, Things like that is included in opioid availability session. So that uh, if uh, in your state, if you don't have uh, morphine, this session will help you to understand how to uh, procure morphine and all other strong opioids included in essential narcotic drugs. So that's the aim of opioid availability session.
How many of you will be able to join on Saturday? Please I can give, join. Please give your attendance by chat. Um, shall we continue? Uh, uh, sir, the voice is still breaking. Can you speak a little more? So the problem is that, you know, my fix. So I'm using the mobile network to access. Um, so I don't think there is an immediate solution. Uh, is it still bad? Uh, now it's clear, but uh, sometimes it breaks. But you can continue to talk. Let's see how it goes. Is it any better now? Sir, so you can continue, sir. We will see, sir. Uh, sir. Is it better now? Yes, sir. Okay, okay. So, so can I share the screen, sir? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Okay, so, so he decided uh, something else, you know, not to let another person down. So he was looking around for people whom he can work with and try to uh, try to help other people in need. Now, this is the story of one volunteer, a person who has gone through an experience, uh, who has faced the, the uh, the challenges of um, you know healthcare, especially when you're going through a serious illness. So now, next screen, uh, Raju. Next screen, please. So, so the question is, you know, what all things can he do? Now, we are talking about an ex-serviceman who has been trained in defense you know he has been trained in warfare uh, what can can he do to help someone in need what can do he do in palliative care now can anyone answer that question what all things can a palliative i mean a volunteer do what all can he do in palliative care as part of the healthcare team Anyone? Dr. Yes, Dr. Sirag. Counseling. Okay. Uh, Dr. Purnima. Uh, yeah, I feel uh, very often as a healthcare provider, there are a lot of gaps between providers and seekers. So I would think that the volunteer's basic role would be to bridge the gap between the healthcare providers and the healthcare seekers. And uh, communication is the basic key. So if communication can be sorted out by the volunteer at various levels, then uh, that can be an important role. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, you are right. Anyone else? Dr. Ambli have replied like organizing screening programs with the help of healthcare providers.
okay so yeah all this and more see uh, when we think about palliative care and when we think about volunteers first of all we imagine that that person has got no background in uh, uh, healthcare or no medical background no that need not necessarily be the case sometimes it could be a person a nurse who is coming forward so if that person is trained obviously he can get involved in the palliative care uh, this thing directly now of course the communication the connection with the community all those things are important but what i would like to highlight here is uh, raju can i can we just move forward a bit okay now what what i would say here is you know the sky is the limit it all depends on what that person has to offer what is the thought you know you can think about uh, direct patient care you could also think about uh, you know supporting you with amazing patient okay um now now in i now situation in palim india for example we we have always had our treasurer as a volunteer now ours is a trust a public charitable trust and we have always had a volunteer as our treasurer now a treasurer is the person who is the ultimate authority as far as the funds of the trust are concerned now why we have had such a person always you know as a volunteer is because you know that gives us the the highest level of transparency and being a volunteer he or she would be the person to come out and say yes something is not happening this is this needs to be corrected you know they are the people who who will raise the flag if something is not uh, going properly now we need to be prepared to let such volunteers come in and work with us and the biggest challenge is going to be when volunteers come in they will start asking difficult questions it is not easy because their commitment is not towards an organization or to you their commitment is to the patient and the family now if they are not able to get the right kind of care and support the volunteer is going to raise a flag he is going to question you he is going to ask very difficult questions which we should be prepared to answer now once we get them on board we should also be clear what that person uh, can contribute where he can effectively uh, work um, which all areas he can contribute and then also be clear about which all days or times of the day that he or she would be available because un unless there is some kind of a commitment um, in terms of days or time it is going to be very difficult to work uh, with the volunteers next please go ahead so yeah so basically you know we should also try to understand of course all people uh, need not necessarily come with the right attitude and the right um, um, uh, what do you call um, they, they they may not be all coming forward with the right intentions also sometimes you know so we need to be clear you know whether having this volunteer is going to be helpful for the patient or family and if you feel it could be counterproductive you may even need to say no to a volunteer there are situations when we need to say that so screening a volunteer is uh, very important and it is almost as important while you are as as when you are trying to hire a um, uh, 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 paid staff you know so and we also need to know um, whether he has got the right kind of qualification suppose we want him to get involved in accounting or you know maintaining the books of accounts uh, he or she should be uh, trained in doing that uh, if someone is helping out with the technical aspects he should be trained in the techno technical side of things so so those things need to be taken care of and also apart from all these things volunteers should also definitely undergo palliative care training because 
What happens if they are not trained in palliative care is they may have the heart to do, their intentions may be positive, but ultimately it may be counterproductive as the care is. I'll give you one small example, you know, someone who is uh, going and meeting a patient. We all know that before meeting a patient, especially uh, you know, uh, bedridden patient, he is prone to diseases and, and, and as caregivers, we should take extra care before we, we go closer to them, before we handle them with our hands. So basic care, like, you know, whether you are um, physically fit enough, you know, whether your health is okay before we go to a patient, one. Second is you need to clean your hands, wash your hands properly before we even touch that patient. Now, these are things which are, tra which are part of the training uh, which we offer for a volunteer. Now, unless that person is trained in these things, you may have a volunteer go and meet a patient and the, the patient may contract a disease which is going to be even more, or which may complicate things even further. So that is the relevance of training. It is not just the heart that you need. You need to have the skills and, uh, and, and that is where the training is important. Of course, they need to be supervised and evaluated. Their performance should definitely be evaluated. Next screen. And one critical thing is to understand, you know, what, what makes these people do what they're doing. Like when, if I go back to Ker Nair situation, you know, there is a reason for him to, to come to, uh, to this team or, or start getting involved in palliative care. And he's looking for something out of this. When he's involved in that palliative care, uh, uh, offering palliative care, when he's involved with us as part of our team, he is also expecting something in return. Now, what is it that he is expecting? We need to know that. It is not in terms of money for sure, right? So that makes things even more difficult. If it is money, if someone is looking for money, it, it is much more easier. You know, we can pay them the money and the problem is solved. Here, it is not as simple as that. So we need to know what is it that they are looking for? What gives them the satisfaction of doing what they're doing? And once we realize that, then we can, we will know what to offer them and also know, you know, how to keep them happy and contributing. So it is important to understand each volunteer as an individual and understand what he or she is involved, I mean, why she is involved in this particular activity. Next screen. So here we now realize that it is about working as a team. Um, a team, as we discussed earlier, which comprises of the doctors, nurses, you know, paramedical staff, psychologists, sociologists, um, MSW, whatever. And we are also talking about volunteers here. Now, it's a big team. And it makes things even more complicated when we are talking about multiple organizations also getting involved apart from the team. Now, if you go by the definition of collaboration, it says working together to achieve a common purpose. Now here we are very clear about the common purpose. We want to make sure that a patient and a family in need of palliative care, they are able, or healthcare in general, they are able to access the care that they deserve. That is fine. Now, it is easier said than done because when multiple entities are involved, things get even more complicated. So why collaborate? Next screen. It's about you know, bringing together areas of expertise, so that you have more productivity and even innovation. Uh, next. Now, as I said, it becomes even more complicated because sometime back in India, 
or at least in Kerala, the situation was that there are probably a handful of um, NGOs like Palim India who are offering palliative care to patients. Today, the scene is different. There are many, many more NGOs. Uh, NGO, when I say NGO, they are non-government organizations. There are many more community-based organizations. And, and we also have the public health system, uh, the, the primary health centers and the, 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 the other health um, facilities offering palliative care. So we need to be working with all of these entities. And that is why collaboration becomes a must. Next. Okay, in the case of Palim India, you know, if we were to look at providing care to patients directly, there are always limitations. You may be able to provide care to, say, a few thousand people directly with a facility in Trivandrum and with the, the home care teams going out and meeting people, that's all fine. But if you look at the overall need in the society, and what as, a, as an individual organization or, or a single organization working in that domain, you know, trying to address this need, there is a huge gap. The, the numbers who require palliative care would be in terms of tens of thousands. Now, what does that mean? If you are, if you are, if you are to provide effective palliative care to a larger number of people, you need to be working with multiple organizations. And when I say link centers, each one represents an entity. It could be a medical institution, a, 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 a medical college. It could be a hospital. It could be CDOs, other NGOs, whatever it is. So we work with, for example, uh, the medical college in Trivandrum, where we offer our services. A team from Pali Media goes there and offer our services to to, to the, uh, in, in collaboration with the community medicine department, uh, to the patients in the medical, government medical college. Now, next slide, please. So what essentially that means is, you know, we are able to reach out to a larger audience, larger number of people. And not just that. Let me share the story of Sita. Just, yeah. Again, the background is that, you know, she is a palliative care patient. Paralyzed, I mean, she had some kind of a growth in her spinal I mean, area and then there was a surgery and then she was um, uh, wheelchair bound. But now today, she is the only earning member of the family. She has got her parents whom she's also taking care of. Now, the story is very interesting. Initially, she had her healthcare needs while she came to us. There was some physiotherapy and other things which uh, were required, which were given. There was medication that was required, that was also done. But what next? You know, once she went home, there are new problems. Like, typically, none of these houses are wheelchair friendly. We all know that. Even my house is not wheelchair friendly. Now, even if I have a wheelchair, I will not be able to manage uh, things inside my house. So there was a modification of the house that was required. Now, how did we get it done? Of course, it is not everything done by Palim India. The local community got involved. There was someone who came forward and said, we'll do the notifications for that patient in her, in her house. Now, once that was done, it was about, <clears throat> you know, what do they do for a living? Now, someone came up with the idea of, you know, uh, training her to, to make jewelry. Yes, the volunteers came forward and trained her to do that, but then that was not a, a solution because what happens is, we give them the training to make jewelry, but then we find that you know they are not able to sell their stuff and then recover money out of it. So someone came forward and gave a new idea. You know, why don't we help her or teach her to sell jewelry online? Use Facebook and other social uh, media to do that. Idea was good, but the problem was she didn't have any computer background. So then someone else came forward and said, okay, I will provide her training in using computers. She was trained in using computers, but she didn't have a computer or an internet connection. The local internet company came forward and said, okay, we'll provide the telephone connection, we'll provide the internet connection. A good 
Samaritan came by and said, okay, I will donate a computer, a used computer. And then she was online. And once that happened, she was able to start selling her jewelry and make a living out of it. Even today, she does that. And uh, she, as I said, you know, she's, she's supporting her entire family. Now, if you look at what has happened, there's so many things which came together. Apart from that, you know, she didn't have a, 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 a her house was not accessible by road. The panchayat came forward and said, okay, we are willing to do it provided, um, provided the, the neighbor, neighborhood, you know, they came together and offered their land. So they came in and offered their land and then the panchayat made it, uh, 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 what do you call, uh, motorable. The, the road was motorable. Now, the panchayat is involved, the local community is involved, Palian India is involved. A lot of entities came together, make a huge difference in the life of Sita and her family. Now that is the kind of collaboration we are talking about. Next. And you should understand that each collaboration takes a lot of time and effort because this will all fail if we feel that, you know, because we are doing this for a good cause, everyone is, you know, going to forget about their personal interest and work for this cause. No, it doesn't happen because we are all human beings. So we all have our own self-interest, which will continue to play a role. Next. Apart from that, we also need to understand that any of these collaborations, now, if we are working with the government, if we are working with a government institution like a medical college, or we are working with the panchayat, it's all possible only if there is some kind of leadership. Like we may have multiple entities coming together and working for this to, to find a solution for Sita, fine. But then there should be a leader who can come forward and look at bringing these solutions together, bringing these people and entities together and achieve the results. Now, until and unless that happens, a collaboration is also not a reality. Now, where does it start? Next. So the simple answer is, it starts with me. I am the person who has to de decide, yes, this is required for my patient, my community. And it, start with, it starts with a, a process of inquiry. It starts with the process of asking the questions, the hard questions, you know. And once those questions, you know, we are able to find answers to those questions. The questions would be, you know, what is it that is lacking in the current system? Why is it that I should be the I should be involved in providing this care? What is it that I can offer to solve this problem? Those kind of questions, it's a, it's a process of inquiry. And once you are through with that, I'm sure we'll come out with answers to some of the questions. Oh, the previous slide, please. Previous, yeah. And therein lies the innovation. You know, sometimes a small change in the approach might be the thing which changes everything going forward. Like for example, again, if you come back to the Kerala scenario, in a developing country, we didn't have a model for effective delivery of palliative care until 2000, I mean, 1992-93. Now, the challenges were many, just like in any other part of the country. Uh, a government system which, which didn't have the right kind of funding or the facilities to offer that care. People who were not trained, all those things were, were there. But then the innovation lied in the fact that, you know, the community got involved and that changed everything. That, that was a solution for most of the problems. Now, that is the kind of innovation that I'm talking about. And once that innovation happens, you know, 
And what has happened in Kerala need not necessarily work in another part of the country because each part of the country, the problems are unique. So because of which the answers are also going to be very unique. What works in one part of the country or one part of the world may not necessarily work in another part of the world or the country. And once this starts happening, it inspires a lot of people to come forward and participate, offer more support, and of course the patients and the families also get the benefit. And once that happens, you know, people start getting the benefit out of it, therein the, the next cycle starts, you know, it creates an impact. It creates an impact in the society. Next slide. So it is kind of a ripple effect, if I may say so. The individual going forward and, you know, influencing the community, which in turn influences the society at large. So, so this is the kind of ripple effect that we need to have in each and every part of the country so that the palliative care movement goes forward. It is not just enough to have a few uh, big centers in, in the, the, what do you call the metropolitan cities? No, we are talking about millions of people in need and, and we need to be able to address that. Next. So what is the key to collaborative working? It is something which we have all been trained to, you know, understanding what each of the other partners want and working together. And what is most essential here is listening. The fundamental thing, what we learned in communication still holds good here. Once we start listening to other, other organizations or individuals, we understand what they are in it for, what is their outlook, what they are looking forward to achieving. And then it becomes much easier to work with those entities. Next. So we move on to advocacy. Now, again, it's simple. The definition seems very simple. It is about drawing the attention of the community and the policy makers. Now, Anything that advocacy, if you look at it, it comes from the word advocate. That is, we are fighting for the rights or trying to support someone who is voiceless or not able to stand for himself. Now, we are playing the role of an advocate. When I say we, I'm including you and me as part of this advocacy. Each one of us should be doing this. Why? Because even today in the country, palliative care is something which a large majority of the people don't even have any idea about. And we don't need to go far. Even I believe most of you are doctors. You ask your own friends, doctors in your own institutions, how many people have an awareness about palliative care so that that is a huge gap that we are looking at. So we need to be doing a lot more of this to make sure that you know palliative care reaches each and every corner of the country. Next. So the focus areas, obviously, government bodies, residents associations, schools, colleges. Now, out of this, I would say the most critical are the press and you know why because the reach of the press and the media is much much more than what we can we can hope to achieve as individuals and and another important category is schools colleges and other institutions now what can we do there as individuals the simplest thing that we can do is go ahead and talk about the issues that the patients are facing, the community is facing in terms of healthcare. Start off with conversations with individuals and groups and automatically, you know, that the, 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 the society will start realizing the need and I'm sure 
people will start talking about uh, you know finding solutions for 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 this kind of uh, gaps so next so as i told you know it can it can help change the attitude of the community or even the the government you know officials sometimes what it can also do is change policies like for example even with um, all the things that were happening from 92 onwards uh, in kerala it was not until the the government of kerala came out with a palliative care policy in 2008 did we have a major change in the at the grassroots level because then what happened was you know it it percolated to to the uh, to the phcs and the chcs which meant that every single you know primary health center in kerala had at least a palliative care trained nurse to offer some kind of help for the for the um, uh, the, the community or, or rather the patients and the families now that can happen only if the government also gets involved which means there has to be policies in place of course all policies do not actually translate to action that is another challenge which we need to go through and of course even today we don't have uh, uh, training i mean the the doctors and the nurses being trained in palliative care while they are going through their uh, mbbs or or their bsc nursing course now that is something which we need to bring in now most of these things are also happening parallelly but i think uh, all these things need to come together to to make it uh, more effective and it also helps in fundraising so that is a good part you know what a, the moment there is more awareness in the community more people start talking about it it also helps with fundraising why because if i were to go to someone and ask for 10 rupees for one of my patients who is 70 year old and who is probably looking at a few more days in this world and i also go to that same person saying that i have got a 10 year old kid who needs to have some kind of support with maybe a, a, a surgery with which he can be brought back to normal life typically people would tend to choose the second option you know if i have 100 rupees i would rather put that money to save the kid than the 70 year old putting that money on the 70 year old because we still are not clear what difference we can make by supporting the 70 year old and supporting this family how that can also impact their children and their grandchildren so so unless we are clear about it it is difficult for us to ask for funds and 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 uh, ensure that there is sufficient support in terms of monetary support for all the work that we are trying to do next so i think we are running out of time here so i'll try to finish off in another um uh, 5 minutes take you through a uh, few more slides so it's about uh, see fundraising is it's about people giving to people now this is a mistake that we often make you know we go and talk to people and ask people to give to our organization no nobody is willing to do that i'm not happy giving to an organization i would i would like to know how the patient is going to be benefited or the the primary what you call care receiver is going to be benefited i am willing to support that person now i will give money to an organization only when i am 100% sure that by supporting this organization by giving 100 rupees to this organization that organization in, in turn will be able to provide the care or make sure that this money reaches that person in need so 
a donor would always like to know how the person at the other end the care receiver is benefited and it is about you know playing that middleman's role each one of us we should be able to do that now how do we do that it is always about storytelling it's about stories of people the patients the families who are in need and of course once they are able to get some benefit out of it those stories would also help and definitely it is not about selling and it is not about money let us be clear about it because money is just a means to an end so when we go ask for money nobody will be willing to give so when we talk about the patient the family the need their need and how we can change their life that is when it touches the emotions when it touches the emotion of a person they they start opening their hearts they start opening their wallets now this is the only way you can raise funds just by giving a few statements vision statement a mission statement it just doesn't help and it's not silly we are on both we are both on the same side someone who is a donor someone who is willing to help with money is on the same side as we are we are in it together and what are we trying to do we are trying to solve the problem or the the, the challenge that is being faced by the patients and the caregivers next again finally it is about being a good li listener because that is when we will know what the donor has to offer what the other person is willing to share what is willing to contribute and then that is what you are going to get you can't just go in there and you know put your hand inside the person's uh, uh, wallet and take money out of it no he has to open his wallet and he has to give that means you know he needs to be convinced first he has to appeal to his emotions next so a lot of opportunities there most of it um, you should be familiar with we could organize events it could be about writing grants uh, there are government grants that are available there are organizations which provide grants there there could be campaigns like you know some of the familiar ones like the ice bucket challenge for example it was a social media campaign um, i believe for als right and it made a huge difference the awareness about als grew and so did the 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 the, the fundraising in that particular uh, area now each one requires a different skill set if you are if you are into events it is about organizing an event it is not an easy task it could be uh, for grants it is about grant writing skills project writing skills which again is a different skill set altogether campaigns it is again different so we have to identify what what is it that we can try and do what suits our capabilities and then decide on what to choose where next so here um if you have any questions um um i'm willing to answer or maybe i'll finish the other the next um, opioid thing also and then move on or should we stop here i think uh, we uh, uh, we are planning to have a separate session on opioid availability oh very good so then we we'll skip that maybe we can spend the rest of the time on questions around uh, what we just discussed yeah are there any questions from uh, this session regarding volunteers or fundraising or anything about the organizational aspect of palliative care you can either raise your hand or unmute yourself and speak you can also talk about your experience in this field or related uh, field can 
anybody okay so this can ask a question yes, sure. thank you very much sir for the very elaborate um, presentation uh the concern i have is that um, in my own environment palliative care is not readily acceptable most people that have issues that require palliative care, most of the time they go home to die. And of course, you can imagine the kind of death. So how can I make it more acceptable in my own work environment and even in my own community? Thank you very much. So anyone else here has any suggestions? Thank you, Dr. Grace, first of all. That was a very relevant question. And uh, I'm sure some of you may have some answers, possible answers, right? Anyone would like to? Yeah, all of you will uh, be facing uh, such question that is raised by Dr. Grace. So, are there any idea how to deal with this situation? Okay. So, um, anyone? I, I can't see all of them on the screen. So, has anyone uh, <coughs> or something? No. Okay. No, no. So, um, Dr. Grace. Um, When do we, when are we willing to um, accept a new concept? It's only when I see the benefits, right? Only if it, if I start seeing the benefits of a new approach, will I start accepting it? So my approach would be first take one patient at a time. Focus on one patient at a time. There is that person in your hospital whom you know is suffering like hell and nobody is listening to him. Now, that is where it all starts, listening. Go to the patient, listen to him. He will tell you what he or she needs and see if we can make sure that what he wants is made available to you. It might be very simple things. Like for example, if you listen closely to him, he might say, you know, I would like to meet my granddaughter. Now, how do we solve that problem? Very simple, right? We don't need medical, uh, what you call degrees to solve that problem. It might be as simple as that. Sometimes it would be different, maybe, Someone might may say, okay, I have, uh, I have terrible pain in my stomach. Maybe you need that medical uh, you know, expertise to take care of that. Now, what happens when we take care of that one single small uh, requirement of that patient? He starts seeing the benefit. There will be a smile on his face which is contagious. That smile is contagious. He will start talking about this. He will start talking about this, what he got from Dr. Grace to five other people. Those five people will come looking for you. I can assure you that. Now, there is no shortcut here. It has to start with one single patient most probably that patient is waiting for you. Have I answered your question, Dr. Grace? Yes, sir. Yes, thank you, sir. Thank you. Anybody else want to ask any questions?
Now, um, so since there are no questions, I would just like to um, add one more thing here. Now, typically, uh, when you talk about organizing a healthcare activity, whether it is palliative care or anything of that sort, um, there are quite a few questions that come to your mind, like um, um, uh, what are the kind of licenses that we need to get to start off with this kind of a, a service? Do we need to have a, a, a certification from the government to provide this? So those are the kind of things which normally are focused upon when we talk about organizing palliative care. I have certainly kept that out of the, uh, in the presentation for a very specific reason. Because what I believe firmly is that, you know, those are the small things which definitely can be done. We'll find that out along the way. And each area, it would be different. Like what, what is relevant or what is applicable in Kerala will not be applicable in, in another part of the world or another part of the country. So those things are local uh, challenges, which definitely we can solve. I have no doubt that once we have clarity on what we need to offer the patient or the family, we will find ways and means of tackling those hurdles like government regulations and stuff like that. So it is not, it is not about uh, getting a license. It is about more about understanding the needs of the patients and the family and trying to find innovative ways of solving those, those issues. And, and I can also assure you one more thing. If there is a patient in need, and I go forward, go meet him in his house and try to solve his problem. There is no government in the world which is going to come and ask me, who asked you to help that person? Nobody can question me because it is my duty and my right, I consider, to help another individual in need. So, it is not about licensing, it is not about all the other, what you call the, the formalities, the statutory thing. Of course, there might be situations like in the case of opioids, I'm sure that is going to be one full session, which is very relevant because uh, those are areas where there are very big restrictions. Um, so, so if you need to provide someone with opioid, you need to have that kind of licenses or you, know, you need to be trained in administering those things. I'm not talking about that. But what if that person, like we uh, discussed earlier, someone wants to see uh, his granddaughter or just wants to go out and see the sea or maybe have a, a, a chicken biryani I mean, to put it in Indian context, you know, it is a chicken biryani what I want. I mean, I don't need a license to, to provide that to a patient, right? So, so those are things which I'm sure we'll provide, we'll figure out how to do it. So that is not something which we have covered here. It is about the other aspects what we have talked about here. Sorry, any other questions? <laughs> Anybody want to um, set up a palliative care unit in your area? So another question which, uh, which I face regularly is, you know, um, we talked about this gentleman, K.L. Nair. So everyone wants, uh, you know, often wants to know, you know, how can I find another K.L. Nair who can support me? 
or essentially what they're trying to ask is, you know, how can I find a volunteer to help or support me in, my, in what I want to do? Now, my answer to that question is, you will never be able to find a Ken Nair if you go to go and try to find a person like Ken Nair. You know, the only option that works is that Ken Nair to come to you. The volunteer will always come to you. You don't have to chase the volunteers. And when will they come to you? When they start seeing the difference that you can make in your society. It can be just one single household. It can be one patient and the family, which can, I mean, if someone sees that person and the family getting benefited out of what you're doing, the volunteers and the society will come after you. You don't have to chase them. Okay, um, I think um, we are nearing the end of the time. Um, if there are no further questions. Um, okay, I think uh, hmm, today we have discussed about um, volunteering, uh, advocacy, collaboration and fundraising, which are very relevant to start a new pilot career. And uh, community involvement is uh, one of the important thing uh, and with which uh, we can also give uh, the total care to the patient. Uh, when we are only medical staff or medical personnel, we will concentrate more on physical problems. But when we have community or volunteers with us, uh, they will uh, they are ready to provide all the other aspects like psychological support, social support, financial support, and even spiritual problems, they can find some solutions. So it is important to have community with us and uh, uh, finding out resources for running a palliative care uh, center uh, is something which uh, every palliative care center faces. So it is important to have collaborators and how to raise funds and uh, uh, this should be spread to uh, uh, the community and uh, advocacy is uh, one of the important thing which we should uh, be doing and there are many methods by which you can uh, conduct advocacy programs um, so um, typically we need all these aspects uh, to set up a pilot care unit and to run it properly. Uh, so thank you, Binod, uh, for uh, being with us uh, for today. Um, and uh, thank you all for uh, joining us. Uh, and uh, we will have a session on end of life care on next Thursday. Um, and we are also planning a session on opioid availability, uh, which will be informed to you later. Thank you all for joining in. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all. Thank you for giving me this opportunity, Raju and Dr. Sunil. And uh, thank you.